Shalom and uh, welcome to the European Report. Uh, here we are to, uh, this month's edition in, uh, in our London studios as the European Parliament is currently on recess and we'll be discussing the EU's funding of the Palestinian Authority and in today's programme I'm joined by Michael McCann, Director and Founder of Israel Britain Alliance. Welcome to the European Report. Thank you Simon. And also uh, David Hathaway, uh, founder and director of uh, Eurovision. So welcome to the programme, David. Uh, Thank you. So any questions come up regarding Russia, you're a man. <laughs> so uh, I'll firstly uh, start off with you, Michael, because um, with Israel-Britain uh, Alliance, um, one of your early campaigns was to focus on the funding of Palestinian prisoners that are actually terrorists who actually receive um, salaries on behalf of the Palestinian Authority, which is funded through uh, international aid and development money, whether that's from Britain or the European Union. Um, why is it taking so long to raise this issue of uh, the Palestinians' complicity and also support for Palestinian terrorism against Israel? There isn't any doubt the case has been proven on uh, a, a number of different occasions. The evidence is stacked up against the Palestinian Authority. They themselves admit that they, they pay their martyrs or and their terrorists, people who have committed terrible crimes, uh, salaries, uh, not based on the, the familial need outside the prison. So if a, a prisoner's got five kids uh, under the British system, the welfare system would look after those children uh, while the father was incarcerated. It's, the money is paid on the basis of how heinous the crime is and how long they're, they're serving in prison. And some of the salaries are, are quite colossal. The case has been made. And I think I've said in this a previous show before, that um, when I met with the Palestinian Authority Finance Minister in 2013 and asked him the direct question, do you pay salaries to terrorists in, in prison based on uh, the length of time that they're serving, based on the, how heinous their crime has been, his answer was simply, yes, we do. It costs us a lot of money and we'd rather not do it. So it's been proven beyond peradventure that these payments are made, the Palestinian Authority accept it. However, and this gets to the number of it, if you want the political analysis, the reason the, the, that uh, Western governments refuse to do anything about it is because they believe that if they stop the aid, it will close the door off to any possible peace settlement. Uh, I believe the contrary. I believe that, that the status quo, the funding of the current arrangements, means that there will never be any peace agreements because the Palestinians or the Arabs have never been forced to look at the necessary steps to make a peace settlement and because we fund UNRWA and because we fund the Palestinian Authority uh, directly, it allows them to continue their nefarious activities and therefore it protects the status quo. And until we change that status quo, we'll not see any uh, movements forward for peace. Yeah. Uh, uh, and David, maybe a kind of wider um, question. Uh, why is it that uh, the European Union, particularly when it comes to its foreign policy, seems to single out Israel, whether it's um, fun indirectly funding uh, Palestinian terrorism through the uh, Palestinian Terrorist Prisoner Programme, or uh, the incitement uh, to violence and terrorism through the Palestinian education system and its media? Um, and at the same time, uh, identifying that the biggest problem seems to be from the European Union's perspective is uh, Jewish settlements, uh, either in Judea and Samaria or in Jerusalem. Well, it's, it's a big issue and it's not just uh, the European Parliament that's involved in this, as you know. My involvement in Israel goes back to 1961 and we've been very active in working that and still are. But I, I can see that it's not only the European Union. Uh, the fact is, if the a majority of the nations within the European Union were pro-Israel, it would change it. But it's the fact that even in Britain, uh, we have failed Israel. I mean, I've been in uh, meetings celebrating, you know, the Balfour Declaration, uh, very involved in things like that. But we, as a nation, failed Israel many times, failed in the full implementation of the Balfour Declaration. And what concerns me is that while we're still in the European Union, that we don't raise a voice in opposition to this, which we should do. But you see, we're allowing, uh, particularly in universities and other areas, a great deal of anti-Semitism. And when you look at the Labour Party today, so it's not just uh, a matter within the European Parliament, it's 
the support generally for the Palestinians. And of course, as you know, a lot of it comes down through replacement theology. And working as I do, actually, with the Israeli Knesset, I have friends there and I speak in the Knesset sometimes, what I'm aware of is the, the problem because there are many people even in Israel who don't accept the legitimacy of the Israeli state. For example, the Orthodox Jews say that uh, Israel is not what it should be. It's a secular state. And of course it is. I mean, Tel Aviv, and I felt a lot of missions in Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv boasts that it's the pride, gay pride capital of the world. So what you've got to understand is it's, yes, I know we're dealing with this question, and, and I agree with you that it's wrong that, uh, that the Palestinians are funny, but it's a wider question of the general acceptance of Israel. Absolutely. And um, Michael, I've got some information here. As of uh, January, the EU pledged to increase its spending to the Palestinian Authority to 42.5 million um, to bridge the gap between the uh, withdrawal of US funding to the Palestinian Authority by the uh, Trump administration uh, and to fill that gap. Now, considering that the EU now is predominantly the main funder of the Palestinian Authority, isn't it essential then that uh, the European Commission and the European institutions do their best to ensure that money is not used to fund or support or incite terrorism against Israel? Of course, the answer to that question is yes, but do you have any confidence it's going to happen? Absolutely not. Uh, the actual figure, that's the additional money that yep. you're referring to, it's actually 300 million euros a year, so it's now over 300 million euros a year. I, I agree entirely with what David said, it's much wider than just the European Union. This is about, well look at the United Nations, the United Nations have just voted in one of their subcommittees to make Palestine a country, a sovereign state that does not exist, the spokesperson for their group. I mean this is a madness that occurs when you have been fed a false narrative, or as Donald Trump would describe it, fake news for the last 50 years or so. And one of the things that I have to you know, agree with David with is that w there's been a collective failure because we have relied, and in this country we relied on the elites uh, to support Israel, thinking that if we had a, a prime minister who was supportive of Israel, whether that be David Cameron, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, whomever, then that was fine. But what we neglected is we neglected that uh, the basic support that you, you would request from normal members of society. And what they've been fed is a diet of uh, Palestinian narratives which are completely false. And I think we have to get back to the basics and remind people that the Arab nations were offered a state in 1937 through the Peel Commission. They were offered a state in 1947 through Resolution 181. They refused in both occasions, started three wars in 48, 67 and 73. And then when they realised that they couldn't defeat Israel militarily, they then resorted to terrorism. Now, anyone who looks or who looked at that history as a bystander and was asked to make an assessment about who's right and who's wrong could only reach the conclusion that Israel was right and that the Arab nations who then rebadged as Palestinians were wrong. But somehow we've got to a position in 2018 where the nations of Europe believe that somehow Israel is responsible for all of this. So we have to make sure that we get our narrative out there and put the tough questions to them. So, for example, when I had a suggestion yesterday that by an organisation called CABU, which has now been tweeted all over the place by people like Tommy Shepard, who's an MP in Scotland, saying that the Israeli government is preventing Palestinian cancer patients getting treatment. Now, that's pretty outrageous if it was true, but it's not true. What's actually happening is that the Palestinian Authority are not granting these individuals, these people who are sick, pa passes, permits, to leave their area to go to Israel and get the treatment. And secondly, the Palestinian Authority are refusing to pay for the treatment. So they want to get all the money that we supply in terms of uh, aid, and they want Israel to pay for the treatment for medical care for the citizens that they're responsible for. Quite frankly, you could not make this up. It's utter madness. And perhaps if they spent less in terror and guns and bullets, things that can harm mankind, and then employed it and used it to help their own citizens. We've been a far better place. That's the sort of cynical nonsense that has to get exposed. Absolutely. So let's have a look now at uh, this report suggesting why there's an urgent need to uh, stop the funding of the uh, Palestinian Authority. 
If I told you that Palestinian terrorists receive a governmental monthly salary and that that salary is much more than the average salary of a Palestinian worker, you would probably think I was crazy. But this is exactly what is happening. The Palestinian Authority is funneling annually hundreds of millions of dollars to terrorists and to their families. In 2016, that amount came to $300 million, according to figures available in the Palestinian Authority public budget. The PA institutionalized sponsoring terror against Israel, with approximately 7% of their annual budget allocated to the cause of rewarding terrorism. How does one get a pay raise in this system? The longer you spend in prison, the more you're paid. In other words, the worse the crime, the more the cash. These payments reflect the Palestinian attitude towards Zionism. In their view, the struggle against Zionism is the essence of being a Palestinian, and therefore every way of fighting Zionism is justified. The law, according to which these payments are made, refers to these convicted terrorists as the fighting sector within the Palestinian society. Not only are these payments illegal under international law and contradict the Oslo Accords, but they are fundamentally immoral. Yet foreign aid from Western nations and organizations continue pouring in to the Palestinian Authority. Donors ignore this uncomfortable reality because they are worried that opposing the Palestinian Authority in its practice of paying for terrorism will further radicalize Palestinians. But the opposite is true. Palestinians perceive this readiness to turn a blind eye to funding terrorism as a green light to continue terror and education in hate. This constitutes the major obstacle to peace. And in order to overcome it, the international community must demand an end to these payments. I'm Yossi Kuperwasser, director of the project on Middle East Regional Developments in the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. And uh, that goes a long way to uh, explaining um, many of the issues at, at stake here. Um, David, uh, when we look at the, uh, the peace process, um, particularly with the um, start of the Israeli-Palestinian peace negotiations, known as the Oslo Accords, um, back in 1993, it was as if the international community, until really the uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in uh, was it 2007, identified the um, incitement to terrorism and the incitement to violence and the complete brainwashing of uh, Palestinian Arabs uh, by Yasser Arafat. Um, do you think this is probably the main reason why we now have an entire generation that have been fed this hatred and lies about Israel to the extent that the highest honor anyone can be within Palestinian Authority is a Shaheed or a suicide bomber is making peace uh, negotiations between the Israelis and the Palestinians in a settlement so much more difficult? Well, of course, uh, it, it's true, uh, it, it is. But, uh, I mean, there are two things to this. What people don't realize is this. There are so many Islamic schools in Britain, and the BBC did a lot of research into it. Every single textbook used in those schools is printed in Saudi Arabia. And because they're in Arabic, you can't check the content. But if you check the content, even here in Britain, you've got this same attitude. But you see, when you look at Israel, and I've had a number of debates with, with the parliamentarians there, because as you know in Israel, there is this division as to whether they should surrender the, the, the West Bank or not. But my experience of Israel goes back to 1961, when I was running a travel company. I, I was the only one taking buses all the way from England to Israel with uh, thousands of tourists. But in the period from uh, 61, when I was taking tourists right through to the Six Day War in 67, there was no agreement between the two sides. In fact, uh, Jerusalem was, of course, as you know, divided, and my tourists were being shot at. Um, if, if they were in Israel, they were being shot at from the Arab side. And also, when we went to um, Galilee, um, up in the north, half of Galilee was actually in Syria. And we used to send tourists on a boat across the lake to a restaurant, and I had to drive the bus empty round to pick them up under shell fire. So, you know, we're looking, at, we're looking at a situation now, but I'm saying that it didn't originate with the Six-Day War. 
it's, it's been in existence the whole time. And I mean, you go back to 48. Uh, I mean, there was no easy position for Israel. Israel had to fight for its identity. But then you come to the whole question of who actually owns the land. And you'll find it, I've just read recently, that actually under law, under Islam, individuals could not actually own land. It belonged to the state. So many of these spurious claims for land and saying, well, you're building on, on Palestinian land belonging to so on, doesn't actually apply. But the whole thing is this, when you look at it, as I've had to do over the years, there never will be a peaceful settlement. Because how can you make any peace agreement with Hamas when Hamas does not accept the existence of Israel? So really, it's a fundamental question. And I don't think there is any political solution to it. Yeah. Um, Michael, what do you make of the uh, Trump administration's decision here back in uh, January? Uh, this is the US State Department announced that we're holding 65 million of a planned 125 million funding payment uh, to UNRWA. And in 2017, UNRWA's annual budget was $1 billion and the US contributed 360 million. Um, and he's also put out uh, a number of different tweets uh, over that period of time to say that uh, you know, the uh, Palestinian authorities got to stop funding terrorism and, and stop attacking the United States, otherwise we'll stop funding you completely. Um, is President Trump taking the right decision um, in terms of dealing with, uh, with this conflict? Yes, yes. But I'll explain that why. <laughs> <laughs> he's making the right decision because um, how long have we been paying the Palestinian Authority? How long have we been uh, contributing to UNRWA? Uh, an organisation that started off with um, something like 750,000 refugees and uh, natural wastage people passing away would have meant that today we'd have 30,000 left at, at, at max and suddenly that becomes 5.2 million. <laughs> it's extraordinary because UNRWA created a new definition of refugee status endorsed by the international community. So now we have an industry surrounding the whole uh, question of a state of Palestine, whether that becomes a reality or not. So Donald Trump was absolutely correct. Something needs to happen to, sh to shake up the status quo. And we have got the madness in our country, uh, using the Labour Party as an example, because I was in correspondence with a, a Labour Party MP uh, who is in the Corbynite wing of the party, who told me this was the solution. Um, there should be no border between Gaza and Israel, and that the blockade should be lifted unilaterally by Israel, and Israel should just come straight out of the West Bank and give Jerusalem uh, to the Arabs, to the Palestinians. That was his solution. Without a genocide? <laughs> the, yeah, the, when I suggested to him there would be absolute carnage Carnage beyond belief. Carnage well beyond what we've seen recently at the, the Gaza border. The answer you get, and it's called, it's called the tyranny of silence, because you can't explain it. Because what they actually want, people who operate in that side of politics, is they want the, they believe, they've now made the Palestinian mandate, which was a colonial venture as we know, uh, because of course of the way that the world operated in, in those times. They want the Palestinian mandate, that colonial part of the world, which can't be put back together again because part of it is now Jordan, of course. Uh, they want that to be Palestine. And they want, they claim that they just want the Jewish people to live in harmony with the, their Arab neighbours. And this will become the new Palestine. That's what they want. It's utter madness. It's completely detached from reality. And that's where we are. So, uh, in terms of a solution, I have great sympathy with David's comments earlier. But here would, here would be my plan. First of all, you have to explain to the Western nations who hold those sort of left or centre views that your solution is madness and can't work. Uh, that it would lead to uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of casualties. In terms of how you change the system, you have to explain to the Palestinian Authority, the game's up. Or to use a Scottish term, the game's a bogey. Uh, your Scottish <laughs> viewers will know that one. And it means that we cannot continue funding the organisations that were only meant to exist as temporary exercises, like UNRWA. And so we stop giving money to the Palestinian Authority directly. The, money, the reason we give them money directly is because it's to build up their ability to be a functioning state. 
they, they've got no intention of being a functioning state because they spend their money in giving it to people who uh, commit terrible crimes. So therefore we have to stop giving them the money. That doesn't mean you stop giving people the money to people who need it. There's many, many other ways you can funnel money into those who are in need and those who need our support. And as, as, uh, as Christians, as people who believe that we should be looking after our brothers and our sisters, then we should continue that work. But we should stop funding the Palestinian Authority, and that means in turn it can stop their machinery of funding terror. So therefore, Donald Trump's position was entirely correct. It's wrong for the European Union to attempt to, 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 blow, or to fund that gap that's been created because of the UN funding. What they should be doing, or the US funding ending, they should be saying, let's join together. Tell the Palestinian Authority, no more money until you come back to the negotiating table. And then until that happens, we're going to look after the people in different ways. And there's no ends to the ways in which that can be done without innocent people being harmed. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, David, we have to talk about uh, British and the uh, European taxpayer uh, because we're just wasting so much money on the Palestinian Authority. And, and actually more money has been spent on the Palestinian Authority than the whole entire Marshall aid plan to build uh, Europe after World War II. Um, it seems to be nothing but corruption, a, a, a black hole, um, and this is not forgetting the horrendous human rights abuses that are taking place within the Palestinian Authority for anyone who criticises Mahmoud Abbas or his administration, um, combined with the fact also that uh, Christians are also uh, being persecuted under the uh, Palestinian Authority. Um, what's it going to take for, for Europe to look at this situation differently? Well, it's very difficult to see. I, I can't really see any radical change in the European situation because they are so totally biased against Israel. And, and it's there. It is bias. But what you've also got to look back is on the longer term, which I, because of my age I do, a lot of the fault was in the beginning when after the First World War we had with France control of the area under mandate. But what we did in dividing the whole of the Middle East was wrong in the sense we didn't take recognition of the different sects, the different groupings, and hence the fact that you've got different religious groupings within one nation. And that really is what first of all sparked off the trouble. And then, of course, when the Jews come into it as well, you've got a real mixture. But, I mean, obviously, as a Christian, I believe in the right, uh, the God-given right of the Jews to live in this area, so-called Palestine. And I would dispute <laughs> the rights of the so-called Palestinians for claim over that territory. But when it comes to funding, then you've also got to look at the boycott in this country of Israeli goods if they're produced in the Palestinian territory. Now, to me, that's a contradiction because the, the goods are produced in, by Palestinians, if you want, by Arabs, in territory controlled by Israel. So if you have a boycott in this country, it's not just, it's not only funding, there's a, it, it's a great deal more than this. It's the undercurrent that when you, you have so, such, public, uh, uh, such publicity over boycotting goods from Israel, even though they're made by Palestinians, you're undermining the whole thing. It's a nightmare. And um, I, don't see, I don't see any solution to the problem until the return of Christ. And I think sometimes, as Christians, We've got to look beyond the present problems and see that the only solution, and there is a solution, and I don't think it's far away, because with my I, I would spend quite a long time talking about the involvement of Russia in, in this, because I've debated the question of why Russia has become involved uh, technically against Israel in supporting Assad and Iran. But when you've got not only the European Union, but you've got America comes into it, you've got Russia comes into it. Oh, to me, it's a much wider question than just the European Parliament. Yes, I, I mean, I agree with you, Michael, that, uh, that that should be stopped. But I see that there's a much bigger problem. For example, I would agree with Trump to bring the, the, the embassy into Jerusalem. Why don't we in Britain? 
And many people are asking that question. Even in Russia, they asked me the question, why doesn't Britain move its embassy from Tel Aviv? But it's a very wide issue. And to me, uh, the interesting thing is the excitement even at the moment in Israel over the Messiah. And there is a very strong feeling amongst Jews that the coming of the Messiah is close. I believe it is. I don't think there will be a solution because the Bible says that God would make Jerusalem a stumbling block to all the nations. And it's going to go on until Jesus comes back. Uh, Michael, I think uh, we've got lost uh, about three minutes of the programme left. So in, in a practical way, um, how should our viewers respond to our taxes being used to support Palestinian terrorism and reward Palestinian terrorists for murders, uh, uh, hideous murders against ordinary Israelis? I don't want to mix my metaphors, but uh, Rome wasn't built in a day in terms of um, defeating false narratives. We've, we, we let the ground uh, be taken over by the Palestinian narrative. Uh, first of all, even calling it a Palestinian narrative because uh, the Jewish people could equally call themselves Palestinians if they wanted to describe themselves in that mandate-type territory. Um, so therefore, um, in terms of uh, moving this ahead, you just, we just have to keep on. I mean, it might feel as if you're hitting your head against a brick wall. You're not. We have to keep on, brick by brick, taking down the arguments. Uh, because this is a simple point. The Palestinian Authority receives all this money. It receives it from the European Union, from Britain, from Norway, from all the different countries in the EU. Remember, we're giving them money bilaterally as well as multilaterally through the EU and the, and the, different, the World Bank and various other organisations. So therefore, if we can get the, win that argument and demonstrate to people that, look, you can't all say that you're not giving the Palestinian Authority m money uh, for, for terrorism because it's coming from somewhere. So it's either coming from the Norwegians, the British, the US, the EU. It's, the bottom line is we're all collectively responsible because we're all putting something into the pot, which they're then taking out and giving to terrorists. So we, keep the, we keep, have to keep on blasting this argument. Final point, there's been a report to release, released today by the International Development Committee about the exploitation of, 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 uh, of uh, individuals who are working by men exploiting women in the aid programme. Completely correct, 100% accurate, something had to be done about it. But the International Development Committee of our Parliament has refused to look at the question of the aid we give to the Palestinian Authority, which has been abused. That is an absolute outrage in our democracy, and we will not stop until it's addressed. Really want to thank you all for watching. Uh August edition of uh, the European Report and uh, we will have a, a, a role and responsibility to play as taxpayers to ensure that our taxes are not being used to fund Palestinian terrorism against Israel or to incite terrorism or to pay Palestinian terrorists in Israeli prisons uh, with our money and so therefore we need to put more pressure on the EU and its institutions including the British government to ensure they don't fund terrorism. So thank you for watching today's European Report.